Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Good afternoon. Um, I really feel to welcome you here for this panel discussion of the documentary film Farming While Black. Uh, we have a wonderful group of folks up here to talk about this film today. Um, who's going to come out and join me, and um, I can introduce you. Um, so. so. So I'll start here with Council X, is a community organizer, transmission artist, and co-steward of Ezelius Res um, Respite Farm and Sanctuary on 13.4 acres of unceded Abenaki land in the Upper Valley. His activities there include harm reduction for your mentorship program, hunting and foraging, cultivating, cultivating perennial and medicinal food sources, and raising heritage breeds, chickens, guineas, and small ruminants. Um, we're also joined by Hazel Adams Shango, who's the co founder and production manager of The Flying Buffalo. It's a market garden farm in Lowell County that she runs with her family. She has a background in public service. She's worked in education in New York City. Um, and um, she's also founder and CEO of an independent parent advocacy business, Being Special NYC. Um, we are also joined by. Um, by Kodel Zaka Sheri, um, who has a background in farming. Uh, Zaka is a Haitian poet and film director. Um, Zaka and his wife, Jetta, started Calabash Gardens um, in Newbury, Vermont. Their farm is now the largest saffron farm in North America. And he's also raising um, his, his child as um, an 18 month old on their farm. And then finally, we're joined by James Key, who is the director at large of the Vermont Beekeepers Association. James has a long history in farming um, and um, began beekeeping in 2017. He earned his certification in 2019, becoming the first Black Vermont certified beekeeper in the organization's 150 year history. Um, he currently works with more than 18 bee colonies as well as working with other um, colonies as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. So while the film is still fresh in our minds, I want to start off with what do you think is sort of the most important point that you'd hope that people would walk away from this film with? I'll get started. Hi, everybody. Hazel. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so many points there uh, in the documentary. Even they showed a still photo of my great grandfather, George oh, Scipio Africanus Jones, with um, the farmers that he helped to liberate. They wanted to lynch them during the red summer of 1919 in Elaine, Arkansas. So that was just a brilliant surprise uh, for me and for my two of my three children who were here with me. I was like, hey, there he is. But, uh, but he is a, a, a part of the farming legacy in America, and so that was just very pleasing. But for me, what I really felt or what really resonated with me is that it's our duty to win. Mm -hmm. And that's all of us. This is talking about farming while black, but as stewards of the earth, as givers of care of the earth and the land, it's our duty to win. And how we do that? Well, we're going to be working on that <laughs> as we go along. <laughs> Yeah, uh, hi everyone, my name is Zaka. Um, but I think from this movie is uh, how happy we are when we are in the land, even though we have a lot of struggle to get there, and, and then how caring we have been uh, when we are there. So for me, it gives me hope so that no matter what it is, we will get there and we find a way to be, to be living in synchronism with our country women. But I think we do that. Uh, hey, folks, I'm James. Uh, I've been with Farmer James. Agriculture is my uh, apiary business. Um, many of the things that were said in the movie, um, I echoed many years ago. That's probably why I'm a lonely black beekeeper. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, I've echoed uh, what she just said about uh, addressing many of the things that uh, organic farming have addressed those sayings about how George Washington Cover and many of our African ancestors were the first. Um, I did that when the Northeast Organic Farming Association started back in the 80s. Um, so that was my quest 
learned and practiced a lot of the things and the theories of my ancestors. Um, I do practice a lot of the beekeeping, beekeeping methods that George Washington, George Washington Carver instilled at Tuskegee Institute and in where at one point in time, all students were mandated to take beekeeping along with organic farming. Um, so I'm trying to reinstitute that kind of tradition because without honeybees, you would not have that diversity. But I also, again, thank the people who put on this event and inviting me here. No, it's fine. Um, I was happy to hear everybody speak. Um, yeah, this film, uh, for COVID considerations, I will not be sharing a mic, but please feel free to tell me to speak up. Um, so, yeah, I, I love this film. Um, I love the book. It was really transformational for me. Um, it taught me a lot. Um, and I think the thing that I took away from this is like to get back to the joy and that we have to do it ourselves. Um, I, you know, we see what government does. Um, hopefully there's mutual aid that can come from, you know, here in Vermont to be able to kind of bridge that equity gap that the rest of our system doesn't really want to touch or wants to keep in place. Um, so it's exciting to be here with other people who are actually able to, you know, be on the land on their own farms and what we're doing for, hopefully for ourselves and for community. And like you said, black liberation is liberation for all people. So, I would just add, um, or you know, stat on what Hansu was talking about. What I really think that Leah and all the other farmers that are, were featured in the film and the collective, they're doing something what we call in our community, like they're keeping the fire burning, and you keep the fire burning. <coughs> the ancestral fire burning, so that the young people in the next generation can see where they need to go. You keep the fire burning to stave away all those little nasty things in the dark. You keep the fire burning so that we have a point of focus and energy that we can join one <coughs> another around. And so basically, I know one thing, I'll use I statements, one thing I'm trying to do by working with my children and my grandson um, in farming, in agriculture, in Vermont, is to keep the fire burning, the ancestral fire, all the strength, courage, and wisdom that we build upon and we live on here. If there has its challenges, very much so, <laughs> but we, we can do it. We can do it. Thank you. So were there any parts of this film that particularly resonated with your personal experiences in agriculture? <laughs> well, I, could, I, I sound pretty loud on my <laughs> No need for a microphone. Um, one thing that really resonated with me is that um, even though this movie brought a lot of attention and awareness about what's going on in farming, primarily with black colored people, people of color with farming, things really haven't changed. Um, they haven't transpired from the screen to reality. Um, so. Yes, it was a great, great, great film, great, great meaning, great, great attention to what is, has been a problem, but really what is a problem now from what I see that hasn't happened here in a state is that people are not sharing their abundance of property. I know a lot of people who have 60, 50, 100 acres, and yes, they're not, as the one woman addressed in the film, willing to share one or two. I find that very odd. I find it very challenging for me. I find myself very alone in farming in this state, a state that is very homogenous. Yes, I'm one and only. I was just, I was one of the first black vice president of the Burlington Farmers Market back in the 90s. But from there to here, what has happened, a lot of book writing, a lot of poetry reading, a lot of music, but not ground roots activity. And the reason I got into beekeeping is because I did hear the same message from the Most High, our creator, that was given to George Washington Carver. 
a man who did not care about wealth, a man who stayed in the classroom, stayed in his laboratory. Even Ford, who created the cars, gave him an elevator so he could take the elevator in his old age to go to his bedroom. But he refused to because his passion was making a change on planet Earth for everyone. That is the same passion that is inside me that has caused me to lose everything monetarily that I have. I will be selling everything that I own because the passion inside of me is to save the only creature on planet Earth that is passive. The only creature that came from the great gods through the tears of emotion. So the honeybee is emotional to me because it, if the honeybees are not here, those little cries that I hear in the back, that will make me very sad because I want those little cries, those little children to grow up to hear and see what I see. So the great whoever it was told me that is my mission. Whether or not I get that acre, whether or not I get any, the mission is to do what I can with very little to make a lot. So what I'm hoping is that whatever was on this screen, maybe we'll seek into the hearts of people who do have an abundance of acreage. And maybe they will share that one. And I, that's all I could hopefully will hope to see transpire. It was really important for me to actually see Blaine Sipsel on camera. Um, I've done a lot of reading around um, his Afroecology, and that's really informed my practice um, and how we farm at Izili's Respite. Um, and to that point, kind of what Farmer James was saying, um, that nothing changed or trying to see that change get here, I become very pessimistic to that, but I think that Afroecology and hearing his ideas actually come out of his mouth um, and what Afroecology means. It is sort of my necessary response to my own pessimism in the world. Um, it is it is a Black-centered understanding of the government in which we live, the system in which we live, and then the food that we grow, the spirituality that keeps us connected that keeps me connected, I'll speak for myself, that keeps me connected to the earth. Um, and also, it was really important to actually hear uh, both both the Penn and uh, sisters' words um, and how they came to farming and feeling very separated from it or, or that it wasn't something that might have been theirs and then that realization um, to reconnect with, with roots. Um, and that's also part of my journey of being really separate from farming at all, and then realizing that like, oh no, this is the path. Um, this is the path. And I would definitely agree with Kansu. Uh, I think they can hear us. Can you hear? I hear them. No. Oh, okay. So I definitely agree with Kansu. Um, just a lot of touch points for me in the film. I raised my children in the Bronx. Uh, it was my daughter that first came home and started talking about vertical agriculture when she was in middle school. Um, my other two children are deeply, heavily into technology. And we were trying to figure out, and I, the momager, I was trying to figure out how can I work on something with my children in adult life and at this stage of my life. I'm a city girl, born and bred, born and raised in Chicago. I raised the children in Washington, D.C., New York City, the Bronx, and now we're here. Um, what I'm thinking is that I'm, I'm not really waiting, because I was the single mom with two children, three children um, at a particular time, and just living in the food apartheid of the Bronx. And it really resounded with me. There was a time in the early 2000s where we had to travel like 45 minutes by like taxi just to acquire some organic fruits and vegetables. 
there was no Whole Foods then in the late 90s and all that. So, you know, you could, there was no central place to, if you wanted to eat healthy, you know, if you wanted to be healthy. And I just feel so blessed and honored that it's at this, you know, stage of my life, I'm 61 years old, that I am able to make this, which might be um, a, a final offering to my children and to my grandson. This is an alternative way of living. And you don't even, even though it would be very nice for people to donate and share their land or the land that they cur are currently under their auspices, but you can create your opportunity as well. When I saw her with the hole on the shoulder, <laughs> that's when Hazel, <laughs> little Hazel and I first went out uh, to our space out in Memorial County, we had some seeds. We knew how to get the water from the river. And I remember seeing my grandmother with a hole. I, that was all I need to kind of get this party started. And there's so much more, and there's soil health, and we're looking at climate adaptation and so many other things. But I just want to raise up. No, maybe things haven't changed in 250 years. Maybe they just actually haven't. But today is today, and we have an opportunity to define our future, our present. And, and we can make that change. Maybe that change wasn't made in the 1980s. Maybe it wasn't made in the 90s, even the 2000s. But right now, where we are in 2024, tomorrow, today, just speaking with someone else, finding out, you know, Vermont Land Link, if you have two acres that you like someone to, you know, work, not work for you, work with you, you know, build with you. That, that kind of thing. It would be awfully nice. <laughs> uh, what I think from that is that it's seeing her in the wood with the uh, kids and trying to uh, a day to day living in the north and wild farming brings me home by doing it in the last seven years. It's, but at the same time, I felt like it's a privilege that Elle could be running outside and knowing uh, um, and can put the dirt in the mouth because we don't bring anything in in the field. And and I feel a little bit connected because they were singing a Ligba song, which mm. is uh, 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 this sp uh, spirit of crossing. I, and then I feel in the way they make their beds, that's the way I came from um, my entire generation in Haiti. I'm the first generation that's moved here. Uh, 13 years ago, and the way we were farming, and then the way that they portrayed that, it's definitely when we can not feel that uh, privilege for the black dog to be running in the woods and skiing and eating dirt and getting, doing really sometimes dangerous stuff. But it's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the points that resonated with me that Leah Penniman highlights is the role of Black and Indigenous people of color in the development and spread of regenerative agricultural practices. Um, and I just wonder if any of you might be willing to weigh in on why do you think it's important to be highlighting and understanding and um, and, and uplifting these this history and these roots? <laughs> you know, from she talked up. Uh, she talked a lot about of the sacredness of ancestors, of our ancestral roles, and things of that nature. And I don't think that you can really like, bond with the earth or strengthen your bond with the earth without feeling the earth, without touching all of our senses, without listening, uh, without smelling all of those smells and things of that nature. Um, you would have to know the history of agriculture in America to even figure out, oh, you know, what is this regenerative agriculture? Why is it that I'm using cover crop here? You know, she was talking about all the rain last year, last July, and the flood and everything. And you've got to let, you got to leave a lot of grass there growing. You've got to cover a lot of that land, or the nutrients will run off. <coughs> the nutrient management, all of those things. 
I, we have been talking about using no-till practices. We are moving over to raised beds um, this season just to, as an experiment and as a project. How can we be those givers of care and help the earth heal while healing ourselves at the same time? and keeping each other healthy, one another healthy and whole. And I I, I just think, and, and final point, there are there's a group down at Tuskegee Institute, presently, uh, Farmer James, that is working with the local community down there and is farming, yeah, Abu, Bakr, Kareem. And, and so these things carry on, whether we hear or see the noise or whether we hear the tree fall in the forest, we have to be there. But these things carry on and, and move forward. I know that here in Vermont, we've got some work to do, uh, all of us, whether you live uh, in the city or you, you, you're living out. Um, we've got to find a way to help restore the earth uh, to its glory. Okay. No, um, I, 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 can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. I guess everything I all I really wanted. I'm not picking on anyone. I'm not biased to anything. Um, all I'm trying to do is say, hey, let's start sharing our skill sets. All right, we all have skill sets. Um, whether we're, we're managing our property, whether we're managing our lives, we all have them. Um, so that's all I'm echoing. Uh, we could talk about all of what we have individually. But, you know, what I did not see um, echo in the voices of, of a lot of what was going on in the movie was the sharing of skill sets. Um, so that's what I, I hope to do more this year, um, where I'm not charging people to learn about bees, but I'm bartering, going back to the days of uh, our ancestors, of not just mine, but also Vermonters. So when I first moved to Vermont in the 80s, I came up here from Washington, D.C. Um, I moved up here bringing all of what I learned in Washington, D.C. But what I learned from many old timers, because I've been up through the Northeast Kingdom and I presently live in Stockbridge, is that there are that few people who will share. Um, so I didn't want anyone to think that there aren't people sharing parcels of their land or anything like that. I just want to echo it louder so we can have more and more people share. So, and that's about it. Thank you. Well, and I think that leads well into another question I want to ask, which is what, you've already spoken a bit about some of the takeaways for Vermont, but what, what other points do you think that we in Vermont can be learning from that can be making this state just a more equitable and safe place for black um, and indigenous, indigenous and people of color farmers? I don't want to forget this, so I'm going to jump in. Um, there's a some sort of uh, there's some sort of bill going through in some of the more denser, densely populated areas of Vermont that is attempting to have people start stop farming, um, get rid of their livestock, get rid of their cannabis grows that are all in line and registered, but people don't like it, and and by doing that we lose, we go back to Giuliani, right? Like we're gonna lose the ability for people to do what they can on 0.25 acres of land on not even an acre, right? Um, and I really wanna kind of stress that I really hope that Vermont doesn't go in that direction and that if there's legislators listening or hearing that, that like that's a bad idea and will increase inequity here, especially for black and brown Vermonters and anybody who's poor, Anybody who's living in densely populated areas as well um, that don't have the same zoning as we do out in rural sometimes, and it's not equitable. Um, so I just, I just really want to emphasize that because the rural gardens are important, city gardens are important. We had to leave Pennsylvania because we were trying to grow on 0.25 acres with a trash ethic of we collect what we can, we salvage what we can, and we couldn't stay there. Um, for that. So I don't want Vermont to turn into that for anybody else either. So to add what he was saying, it's uh, what I've addressed with many other farmers, and that's the business side of what he's addressing. 
Um, and that's what's going on with not just that little micro entity, but it's also going on with pesticides, number one, all right? As we are all have knowledge now that they stopped all the lawsuits against Monsanto, that we all have micro particles in our body and we're all urinating toxins, all right? So what that translate is, is that there is no organic farms in America, all right, period. Um, the the, the hoo-ha and the re-ra and whatever, um, what he's talking about is addressing is that all these organizations cost money. So what the state has done and the federal government are now doing are forcing people to work together, okay, in rural America. Because what they see going on in the cities is that it's just gonna be a wasteland, all right? So what's happening here economically is not just happening with just one person of color. It's happening throughout all the state with all farmers on all all colors, all levels. Bee farmers, dairy farmers, uh, vegetable farmers, etc. The biggest thing that will kill all the farms is taxation. We all know taxation without representation, all right? So it's not a color issue, it's all economic. And that's what I mean by sharing, okay? Uh, we could have a lot of a lot of talks about how we individually are working in collective. Working in collective does not translate to those lobbyists who are already winning in our great state of Vermont and where many people in the Department of Agriculture will not listen to basic farming practices. They listen to the delegated farming practices of America. So what they're focusing on is what is profiting and what is profitable in America, okay? And that's it. Everything else is euphoria. Everything else is fictional. Um, thank you. Um, so on that note, what I'm running into and what I keep hearing is that, yes, they keep wanting us to talk about the color, the color, but everything really is, the color is green, all right? <laughs> Being that the color is green, they put us in the challenge of getting along. Okay, so because the color is green, then they put the color green equates to brown, black, white, whatever. One more time. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't. It. it distracts us, it divides us from what we really need to focus on. All right, and that is again the skill set. So if there's one farmer, okay, what is that one farmer doing? Let's not duplicate it. Let's let's add to that substance. I'm a beekeeper. I need more people of color in beekeeping. But the challenge is many people of color want to garden and raise vegetables. But that practice is great, but it's not self-sustaining to the community because of the fact that they're forcing economic fees on the farmers. So the economic fees on the farmers aren't gonna allow many people who are equitable, are equitably, or have no money. <laughs> All right, we have no money. People of color, doesn't matter, people who are white have no money to get into farming. So how does that happen? How did that happen to me? I'm not sure. I had to read, 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 read yeah. to find the business way to do farming, not the historical scripted way to do farming. And I'm not, hopefully I don't take up too much of your time. Okay, but so what I'm doing is basically the grassroots of farming is this, right? We all start from one seed. The one seed then grows vegetables, but also the seed is really a mental seed, all right? So the mental seed that I'm trying to plant here today is I'm not a fictor, I'm not fictional speaker. I'm non-fiction. So if we keep talking fiction, they're already won. They won, okay? They're winning, okay? Why are they winning? Because they want economic imbalance. They want economic depravity. How will they do it? They won't do it through scripture. They'll do it forcibly because they're already doing it. Where you go through the half of the southern part of the country, they've taken away jobs for many people because of everyone sitting around talking about conversation instead of taking action. If we all took action, if many of the vegetable farmers, instead of starting a CSA, had a vegetable truck and wanted through the communities, yeah. that would change America. 
So that's what I would like to see is a vegetable truck go where poor people cannot drive and feed those poor people. Teach, teach. Come on. Because teach, that to teach. me is real change. This BS about CSA yeah. or any of that, that's not change. That's a diagram, even with me being a Vermont beekeeper, being a board of director, being a speaker, it's not because I'm speaking about bees of Vermont. I'm speaking about the seed of change in America. Okay, the seed of change in America is this. I'm one black guy surrounded by a sea of white beekeepers. They don't give a shit about your color. What they care about is the money coming in. So that means if they'll tell you a goddamn story for you to believe, you will believe it. You will buy their bees because that pays for their boats, their second homes, their meaning they have bees here and they also have bees some other state, okay? And they piggyback and they bring back and forth and use our state as what? A fic fictional tool because Vermont is what? God's country. Vermont is very green. But if you really did your homework, you will see the amount of pesticides, the amount of toxins, the amount of pollinators and other creatures that are disappearing. They're gone. Hard truths, hard truths. They're gone. So this joy that we're having right now, I love it, because we're all gathered together. It's a great, pleasant thing. But what I'm really like hesitant to enjoy is us not really talking about making change. All right. Reason is, is because those people who call themselves government officials, they've made such a great goddamn change. It's going to hurt us. It's going to hurt many of our people of color, many of the people who are in a small community. We're all color. White, black, does not matter. Great. But the fact is, is that they're winning. I'm really, I'm to the point where I can't sleep because I'm so damn worried about next month. Because next month means that. 10 bills will pass. 10 bills that will pass will defeat our purpose. Okay? So I apologize it took up too much time. I'm done. <laughs> but Brother James and I always, not always, we've had free, somewhat frequent discussions. Another position that I take, another position that I take is that irrespective of what's going on around us, you have responsibility. If you want to have the right, you have the responsibility to take action. We need the conversation and the action because we need to come together communally to be able to have open and safe conversations. Bipod, non-bipod, all, everyone, all. But once we have the conversations, then it's our duty to go out and do the work. No, we're not going to change this whole system, but each one of us can impact 10 others by being the change we want to see right here. We can't control all of that. It's very important to know what you can control and what you cannot. And what we can control is here in Vermont. It's coming. People are coming. Long ago, I used to work down on Wall Street, meaning four or five years ago. And someone that I would see frequently on my ride said, hey, Hazel, do you know what climate change really means? And I was like, oh, no, tell me, dude. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know the sun, yeah, the rain. He said, no, climate change is a cold world for people of color. And people of color will be on the move if the climate changes. Because everywhere in the coastal cities, in coastal countries, there are people of color. And if their sea level rises, and they're pushed off their islands, or they're pushed to another part of the country, they're coming. So I would say my advice is, you know, have conversations with people. Be polite, not harmful, you know, and do you mind if we talk? And maybe that's something we'll do on the farm, kid is our, we've been trying to find out, figure out an annual event because the communal farming works for many. I'm trying to work with my priority community, which is my family. I'm trying to make sure that we're treating one another with respect 
and with honesty and with truth and we're dealing with the land in that manner, then I can branch out and invite all the rest of you to the annual event. But you know, you have to, I think it's something I learned in Vermont Relief Collective. We have to work at the speed of trust with one another. And that's what I'm suggesting when we leave here today that we do here in Montpelier, here in the state of Vermont, here in the world, is that we try to work with one another, really genuinely try at the speed of trust and how can we, you know, build things up and stay safe. that we have for this conversation today, but I want to thank you all so much for being here to talk about this and share your experiences. Um, and yeah. Well, I have what I think is an important question. Suppose I had some acreage that I would like to share. Whom do I get in touch with? <laughs> oh, I would uh, definitely get in touch with the Vermont Leaf Collect Farm Collective. Vermont Relief Collective. Yeah. Uh, of we're which I believe we're all, we are all um, members. Yeah, we're all members. So. so I will give you my email address yeah. before you leave, and I'll get it to the organizing squad. Yeah. Thank you. The Vermont Relief Collective. Thank you, sir.